A reminder to everybody, um, we are going to have our afternoon service, 3 o'clock, and then right after that, uh, I'm going to go down to Fredericktown to be with all of Rose's ancestors, all of her kinfolk. Uh, Brother Ron Dagonia has asked me to come down, and um, he wants me to preach on the King James Bible. And to me, there is no greater, um, no greater need, no greater message that I can preach. And you might say, well, what about the gospel? The gospel is the word of God. They are not separate from one another. Where do we get the gospel from anyway? We get it from the word of God. We get it from the Bible. When I've led people to the Lord, I've seen people lead people to the Lord. And we give them Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 1 John 1, 9, John 3, 16, and anything else we can think of. And we give that to them. And I met a young man one time. He was actually, uh, he had a question during a talk I gave up in upstate New York. And uh, I was warning people about new age thoughts and new age ideas that had moved into churches. And this young man recognized the terms that I was using as new age. Come on in. Or he recognized the terms and he said, he said, when I witness to somebody, I use terms like that because they won't understand the Bible. And I said, I said, I don't mean to be argumentative with you, but People are not saved if they're not saved by God's word. 1 Peter 1 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And if the gospel is not right and the words are not right, salvation is not right. Every doctrine, everything that we stand on, everything that we believe about every aspect of God who he is, what he is, how he works, what he does, what he won't do. Even the idea does is everything that God does in the Bible. All of those are founded upon the word of God. And the devil hates the Bible. And, and just going back over some of my old notes and looking into some new things. I've got some things coming out today in a Watchman broadcast. Uh, about the attack on the Bible, and I am I, I think you ought to be thankful that God has given you His Word. Amen. Amen. Where would we be without it? What would we believe? We would be we would be desperate at the hands of evil men if it wasn't for the Word of God. Uh, John Wycliffe, one of my favorite men in the world, Catholic priests saw the abuses that the priests in England were committing to widows, to the fatherless, to people in general, because the Catholic Church would not allow them to even hear the Word of God, much less read it. Anytime they got the Word of God in the Catholic Mass, back then it was all in Latin. And if you didn't know Latin, you didn't know anything. You were, at, you were at the hands of an evil man telling you that you must pay large sums of money. You must yield over your, your estate, your property, your cattle, whatever it is you had in order to get somebody out of purgatory or to save yourself. And even then, your salvation was as temporary as the next sin you committed. And John Wycliffe knew the word of God didn't say that. And so he endeavored to translate the New Testament into English so that everybody could hear the word of God. Martin Luther, same thing. Martin Luther is a monk, Catholic monk, in a monastery, separated from the world, beating himself, literally scourging himself, to try to purge his body from all lust. And he couldn't do it. 
no matter how bloodied he got, no matter how much in pain he agonized, he could never rid himself of the body's natural affections. He could not do it. And he was angry at God. Because he read in Romans about the righteousness of God. And it angered him. Why would God uh, make it so difficult for him, Martin Luther, to become righteous as God is? But he kept reading Romans. He kept reading it. And the Holy Ghost came to him and turned a light on for him. Martin Luther then realized it wasn't his becoming as righteous as God. It was God's righteousness bestowed to him as a favor to him by grace alone. And he believed that. And God changed his life. And here's another Catholic priest nailing his 95 thesis to the Wittenberg door, telling the world how wrong the priests were. Did he get in trouble? Yes! That's the kind of trouble you want. Amen? Amen. Where did these two men find all that? In the Word of God. Amen? Amen. So, similar situation this morning. Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2. Verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna. Right. Or our former pastor, Brother Phil Jones, who was from deep in North Carolina, said Smyrna. 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 These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Now, why did he say that? You're poor, but you're rich. Why was he saying that? They're rich in the word of God. Rich in faith. Rich in blessings that cannot be added up with a calculator. So he said, I, but thou art rich. And he said, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. And I may cover that, won't be today. But are the synagogue of Satan. Now what is the synagogue of Satan? First of all, the word synagogue. Does anybody know what it means? It's actually pretty simple. Huh? A meeting place for for the church people. That's in essence what it means. It's a it's a it's actually not the temple, even though some Jews call their synagogue temple. Um, it's impossible for it to be a temple. It doesn't have a holy place. Doesn't have any of the stuff that God required in the temple. But they call it that. Okay? Synagogue simply means assembly, the assembly place. And it's where the Jews gather together. Uh, a guy that came visited Wednesday reminded me of a story that I told. He um, lived out in Tennessee. And um, when I was at the Bible College in Nashville, Tennessee, the, the property was donated years ago. And it was in an area of Nashville uh, that was a very wealthy area. So there was a couple mansions on this block and they built some buildings onto it, dormitories and everything like that. Anyway, that's where I went to college. Well, the next block over was a Orthodox Jewish synagogue. And I was told that on Saturday, if I got up, which I didn't like to do, but at Saturday, if I got up, I could see the Jews walking through our campus going to their synagogue. They could not drive because they were Orthodox. They believed in keeping the law. So they would walk there and they said, they won't talk to you. Why not? They said, they just won't. You're a, you're a Gentile. They won't talk to you. So I'm going, well, I bet. So I did. I got up and found myself out on the sidewalk and here they come, Jewish man and his wife walking to the Synagogue. They even light the lights on Friday. They turn on all the lights and the heat and everything on Friday. They don't do nothing on Saturday. Can't turn the lights on. Can't turn the furnace on. Nothing. So they're walking to synagogue. And uh, I say, good morning to you folks. Kept on walking. And I'm going, huh, the nerve. So you think you're, I was, I was in an airport one time. And there was a Jewish rabbi sitting there and he was reading his Tanakh. He was reading the Old Testament. 
And I wanted so bad to go talk to him. God never let me go do it. I wanted so bad to go talk to him. To tell him. Let me tell you who Moses really is. Let me tell you who, what that rock was. Let me tell you about the land. You got to pray for those people. They're very, very lost. They do believe the same God. They read the Old Testament. But they are very lost. And their ways and their doctrine are from Babylon itself. So when he mentions the synagogue of Satan. Understand that Jesus, even though... In fact, let's turn to uh, Luke 4. Jesus went to the synagogue. But he didn't have a high opinion of the synagogue. And by the way, there is no Old Testament or New Testament requirement for the Jews to gather on the Sabbath day. It's not there. The synagogue was a tradition that they made. Yeah, they did assemble at times. You can see that throughout the Old Testament. But no law that tells a Jew that he has to go to temple, what they call it, to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Uh, it's one of those traditions that Jesus railed against. You, by your traditions, you've made the word of God of none effect. So Luke chapter 4, this is after Jesus has fasted 40 days in the wilderness. In verse 14, the Bible says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there, see, he hadn't had food for 40 days, but he didn't need it. He had the power of the Spirit in him. And there went out a fame of him through all the region around about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. It all started out real good, and then it turned bad. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. It mentions his custom. But again, no law. No law requiring Jews to gather or in an assembly on the Sabbath day. And stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor... He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, if you look up where he's quoting from, he's quoting from Isaiah 61. And what's interesting to me is, Jesus stopped reading mid-verse. He cut it off. He didn't finish reading the rest of it. He cut it in mid-verse. When he said to preach the acceptable year of the Lord... Isaiah 61 says, and the year of the vengeance of our God. Two different things. One, the acceptable year of the Lord, which is now. And then there's coming a day of vengeance of God. So why did Jesus cut it off? Because he says in verse 20, he closed the book and gave it again to the minister, sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So what he had said was true. That he's come to set at liberty, those who are captive, those who are broken, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's what he came to do at his first coming. You remember what Jesus said? I, I come to judge no man, but I come to save man. That was his first coming. And he closed the book. Right mid-sentence, before he read the rest of it. When he comes again, he's going to open the book once again. That's Revelation chapter 5. And then is going to be the year of vengeance of our God. When he comes the second time, he's coming kicking tail and taking down names. Amen? And he's going to do it. He's going to do it right. So Jesus visited the synagogues. He, and you can imagine, they're all going, did he just say what I thought he said? He's fulfilled, he's the one? Some of them believe. But then you get to the hierarchy. The leaders of the synagogues. The leaders of Judaism. The Sanhedrin, the 70. That goes all the way back to Moses. Moses uh, 
picked 70 men to help rule over Israel. And, and during that time, the Holy Ghost filled every one of them. But over the years, that Sanhedrin became very corrupt. Because here's what they did. The law said, um, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou do all thy work, but the seventh day is holy. It is the Sabbath and you're supposed to rest. So the Jews were not content with leaving that law as it was written. They added a commentary to the law. And then they started specifying things that you could and could not do on the Sabbath day. Like look in a mirror. Not allowed to look in the mirror on the Sabbath day. Why? Because you might see a gray hair and pull it out. And that's not keeping the Sabbath. I mean, when Jesus healed on the Sabbath, what'd they do? They yelled at him. Called him a, her a heretic. Said, kill him. He's healed somebody on the Sabbath day. That's against the law. That's not against the law. It was against their commentary on the law. And then, years later, they wrote, of all things, a commentary explaining the commentary. <laughs> which is why... Those Jews would not talk to me, which is why they walked to the synagogue, which is why they would not turn the lights on on Saturday. They did it on Friday. All because, not what God said, but because of what their rabbis said. And all those things that God told the Jews to not learn from the Canaanites, they learned it. Their customs, their religion... Their practices, their gods, their idols, they learned all of them and they incorporated those ideas into what is now known as Judaism. Judaism is by far not a clean religion. It is very dirty by not just human doctrine, but satanic doctrine. So, notice that Jesus said... They are our, the synagogue of Satan. The Jews and Kabbalah mysticism. And I don't encourage you to study Kabbalah because you'll never make sense of it. It is, it is one of the most complicated and most difficult religious philosophies to ever try to attain to. In fact, the Jewish rabbis who teach the Kabbalah say that only Jews could ever understand it and only a Jew who's older than 50 years old could understand it. Because it takes a lifetime to figure things out. And even then, it's still in a mystery. And I'll tell you one of their core beliefs, and I learned this by way of Jim Staley, who pastored this church up here at St. Peter's, or where was it, St. Peter's or... Uh, St. Charles. Anyway, he was a he had turned Hebrew roots. And I heard him mention in a sermon that he did one time, he said, We have divorced the white fire from the black fire. And I went. Where did he get that? Have you ever heard that, Gary? The white fire and the black fire? Well, you went to seminary. You went to Bible Institute, didn't you? You've read the Bible. Surely you must know about the white fire and the black fire. No? Well, here's what... I, and he didn't explain himself, but he said divorced the white fire from the black fire, meaning they were married. And then I started... I figured out what that meant. But I went to some Jewish Kabbalah websites. And I read up on it. What was the white fire and what was the black fire? The black fire is the black ink where Moses wrote the law on the paper. The Hebrew letters. That's the black fire. The white fire is the white page between the letters. And the Jewish Kabbalists believe that there's more to knowing God that comes from the white fire than there is in the black fire. Now what does the white fire say? We have an expression, reading between the lines. What does that mean? 
<clears throat> What's it, what is in between the lines on a page? Nothing. Nothing. But they say that you can learn more about God from the white fire, the white part on the page where nothing is written, than the black fire, which is the letters and the words that Moses wrote. How bizarre is that? It's like, I'm going to know God, so I'm going to stare at a sheet of white paper for eight hours. And at the end of eight hours, I will have learned something about God that I didn't know before. Okay? So, huh? So what did you learn? Yeah, I learned this. Wasn't that great? Say amen to that. I think I got a louder amen on that than anything I've ever said. So, if they're looking at blank paper and receiving doctrine about God, where are they getting it from? They're not getting it from the paper. Where are they getting it from? Satan. Yeah. Seducing spirits. Doctrines of devils. Yeah. But they're getting it from hell. Okay? They're getting it from... It's the same as... New Age yoga or mysticism telling you you must empty your mind and go into a trance. And in that silence, you'll hear God. God speaks in silence. Which, what does that mean? Nothing. Okay? Yes? One of the things that they teach, because I, I don't know if I ever told you, but there was a girl eight years ago that was heavy, heavy into it. So actually went out in the temple and went to Beverly Hills with her. Um, but the thing that they believe is that, or the one thing that they say, you're in that church or whatever it is they call it, you're not allowed under any circumstances to research it online. Wow. Because if That's the first thing I'm going to do is research them online. What you do, you're going to find out that, you know, Crowley and all these dark magic and occultists and everything, that's what they utilize. Sure. For dark magic. Everything that God told the Israelites not to learn from the Babylonians and the Canaanites, they learned it. They worshipped false gods under the guise. But what did Aaron say when he made the calf? These be thy gods, which brought thee up out of Egypt. He immediately changed their, their whole religion. Okay? Was this all the Pharisees were all of all Jews? Most, most, yes. Most, most Jews now who practice Judaism practice Kabbalah mysticism. And it's not based on what you can read in the Old Testament. In fact, they say there are four levels of understanding the Old Testament. The first level is reading the words on it and understanding that there's a, this is a lamb and this is the temple and so on. The literal interpretation. But they say the fourth and highest interpretation is never written down anywhere. It just comes to you. Several of the Jewish sages they call them received doctrinal ideas by visiting the graves of former Jewish rabbis and receiving of their spirit you know what that's called necromancy going learning and getting something from the dead and God strictly forbid that in Deuteronomy 18 so when Jesus said the synagogue of Satan he wasn't just talking about one little synagogue in Smyrna that was evil I believe he was talking about every one of them. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Madonna is a Kabbalist. Now, let me give you one thing about Kabbalah. Kabbalah says that God, the real God, is too holy and too much spirit to create the physical universe. So they believe in a spiritual world and a material world. What was her number one hit? Material girl. I'm a material girl in a material world. Where'd she get it from? Kabbalah. That's what they teach. Matthew chapter 6 verse 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. Jesus called the people in the synagogues hypocrites. Because there was the law that Moses wrote 
there was the commentary and then the commentary on the commentary. And all of those synagogue Jews followed the commentary on the commentary and the commentary. And they used that as a way to get around keeping the law. And that's what Jesus said. You have by your traditions made the law of none effect. So these Jews in Nashville walking to the synagogue, they were allowed to walk what was called a Sabbath day journey. A short distance. And you could only walk that far on the Sabbath day. So they had a, in the commentary, in the commentary, they had a bypass. You could walk that far, sit down and rest. Get back up, walk another one, sit down and rest. Get back up, keep walking, sit down and rest. That violates the law, but not to them, because they worked around it. So he, Jesus called them hypocrites. They say one thing, do another. That they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Which was what? The glory of men, but not the glory of God. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. This is why when we take up an offering here, we don't announce your name one by one to come up. Put your offering in. Tell everybody how much you gave. And everybody go, Woo! Right? Don't let your let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. That thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues, there it is again, and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Who recognizes this? What is this? You ever watch Star Trek? Leonard Nimoy played the character of Spock. And he developed this. This wasn't in the script. Nimoy came up with this because Leonard Nimoy was a Jew. And he said when his father took him to the synagogue that he was told to close his eyes and not look when the rabbi would stretch his hands out over the congregation like this and give them a blessing. And he wasn't supposed to look, but if you tell a boy not to look, what's he going to do? He said, I peeked. And he said he just stood there in amazement at that rabbi making this sign. And he said that always stuck with him. So when he had to come up with a greeting that Vulcans would do on a different planet, that's what he told him to do. So Jesus mentioned, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, giving there, and there's an occult thing. I won't get into all, what all this means, okay? But it's not in the scriptures anywhere. That they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Matthew 10, 17. Look at what Jesus said. But beware of men. For they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. You will find out that Jesus never had anything nice to say about the synagogues. Because he knew what was going on there. He knew in, in Matthew 23. Turn there very quickly. Matthew 23 is Jesus sermon against bad religion. In Matthew 23, verse 2, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. That's a hypocrite. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogue. You've seen the Orthodox Jewish men with the hats and the curls in their hair and they will be wearing a box. A little, little box, a little cube on their forehead. That's their phylactery. 
And they get it from Deuteronomy 6, where God said the words of the Lord are pure words. No, not that one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, is one Lord. And these things which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. So they took that literally, and they have a little verse of scripture, I don't, know, I don't remember what it is, inside that cube, and then they strap that around their head, and they wear that all day. And to be honest, they believe that God's blessing over them is because he sees them wearing this little cube on their forehead. And that's why God favors them. Which is better? To wear a piece of scripture on your face and not do it or read the Bible and do it. Which is better? Reading the Bible. Okay? Um... Oh yeah, verse 5. But all their works they do for to be seen of men, they might broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments, love their uppermost rooms at the feasts and cheap seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, which means master. By the way, this same Jim Staley that I mentioned, when I would hear him talk, he would never, never say the phrase Apostle Paul. Never say it. Because in his mind, Jesus didn't come to save us from the law of Moses. Jesus came to direct us to the law of Moses. So any New Testament term like New Testament, he never called it the New Testament, he, even though the scriptures do. He called it the renewed covenant, meaning Mount Sinai all over again. Keep the Ten Commandments for your salvation. And he would never say Apostle Paul because that's a Gentile phrase. He called him Rav Shaul or Rabbi Saul. Now what's the problem with that? Two things. Jesus said, call not men Rabbi, for you have one which is your master, which is in heaven. And Saul was Paul's Hebrew name. But after the road to Damascus and after he was saved, from Acts 13 on, he's never called Saul again. He's called Paul. He had a new, because he had a new savior, a new religion, and a new name to go with it. But this guy, and he's in prison now. Well, he got out. Do you know he went to prison? You know, did you? Jerk. I'd have fouled it up. No. He went to prison because he was selling securities without a license. He was, he took out a multi-million dollar life insurance policy on an old guy and sold people the rights to pay in to pay the premium so that when the guy died they would get part of the payoff and Jay Nixon the one thing Jay Nixon did right was throw him in prison and he did so he says keep the law keep the law keep the law what about thou shalt not steal because he never paid those people back. And we're talking about people on a pension who were giving him their life savings. Sometimes twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And they lost every penny of it. Okay? Hypocrites. Um, turn to Luke 13. Jesus, Paul, Paul... When he would go into a certain city and preach, where's the first place he would go to? Synagogues. Why? That's his people. If anybody ought to understand the typology of the law and the prophecies of the Old Testament, it would be the Jews. So he would go and preach what he had learned about the mysteries of God and who Christ was and salvation and all of this stuff. He would teach it because he knew it. And he knew they knew it. Some believe, but most of them hated him so much that just about every place he went, they tried to have him killed or arrested. Until, huh? He went to sin by 12 years old. Yeah. And at, finally, one day, Paul said, I'm done. I'm not going to a synagogue ever again. They won't listen. They won't hear it. 
The moment I step in, they start trying to kill me. I'm just going to go to the Gentiles. They'll believe it. And they did. Luke 13, 11. Behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and, he, and was bowed together and could in no wise lift, herself, uh, lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And look, guess what? The ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. Because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed. And not on the Sabbath day. Now why do you think he really got so bent out of shape? Was he protecting God? What was he protecting? Himself. Because these guys had all of Israel under their control. And they were not about to give it up. Remember what Paul said in Galatians. That just as Hagar and Ishmael persecuted Sarah and Isaac. Those who are born in bondage will persecute those who are free. And that's what they're doing. And so, um, verse 15, the Lord answered him and said, Thou hypocrite. Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? You think nothing about unloosing your ox on the Sabbath day. Why cannot I unloose this woman on the Sabbath day? And Jesus, every time he said things like that, the rabbis would go, and they'd have nothing to say. And that made them angry. And they sought to kill him for it. John 9, verse 18. The Jews did not believe concerning him that had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son? Who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered, answered them and said, we know, not this is our, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. Now look at verse 22. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. I remember back... When Brady Crumb was still in Jehovah's Witness. And, but he was calling me on a regular basis. Because he was figuring out Jehovah's Witness were full of nonsense. And he told me one time, he said, as we were still going to the Kingdom Hall. He said, every now and then, some people from our Kingdom Hall are going to come by your house and knock on your door. And I said, yeah, they already have. I've run them off twice. And he said, please don't tell them that I'm calling you. I said, are you afraid? He said, yeah. And I asked him later, I said, you know, when you told me that, I visualized them taking you off in a room somewhere and threatening you. He said, yep. He said, they would have excommunicated me on the spot just for talking to you. He lived in fear. People, don't let any man put you in fear and bondage they'll do it they'll do it religious people will do it every time even those pretending to be christian they will do it every single time christ came to make us free from that amen it's the synagogue of satan let's pray father we thank you for your word it tells us and it reveals to us, Father, things that man wants to be kept hidden. Evil men, communist dictators, popes, preachers, prophets. They don't want people hearing the word of God. They don't want people reading the Bible and believing it. Because that takes their power away from them. And Father, I pray, dear God, as all of us were in bondage at one time, I hate seeing people in bondage. And I pray, dear God, that your word would make people.
people free from the bondage of evil men. Make us free, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.